Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. A little life in here today. I love it. Uh, like I said, we're starting a new series called uh, the Via Della Rosa, and we're taking a week just to dive through this last week of Jesus' time here on earth. And we're talking today about the triumphal entry. Jesus is about to embark on a really big week, but first he has to enter the city. He has to enter the city. He has to go do this. And he's entering the city at a very unique time. At this time, the city is celebrating something called Passover. And as they're celebrating this, they're doing this because they, they do this because they fled from Egypt when they were set free from slavery. And they do this as a remembrance of what God did. And they, they have practices so much as even uh, to have unleavened bread. Because when they fled Egypt out of slavery, the bread didn't have time to rise. And this whole thing comes from the the, the classic story of as the angel of death passed through the camp, the, the people of God were able to make a signal over their door frame uh, with the blood of a lamb. And so the angel of death passed over their household. And so this is why they're celebrating. And Jesus is about to enter the city. And what he does before he enters the city is he sends his disciples, a couple of his disciples ahead of him. He says, go into the city and get me a donkey and a colt. And bring them back to me. And if anybody gives you a problem, tell them it's from the Lord. How cool would it be if that worked today? You know, I, I was like, I'm, gonna, I'm going to Tesla this week. I'm going to walk in and say, hey, give me a Tesla. And when they say no, I'll say, I feel like it's God's will. So, no, I mean, that's, they send them in and he says, tell them it's for me. And this is what happens in Matthew 21, verse 5. So tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw the garments over the colt, and he sat on it. This is important because what's happening here is Jesus coming in on this lowly donkey is the fulfillment of prophecy. We see this in Zechariah 9.9 where it describes the Messiah riding in on this donkey. And it's important for us to state as Jesus is entering into this time in the city, nobody really understands the importance of this moment. But Jesus is riding in on a donkey and it's, it's big for this timetable because he's riding in and in kings in that time, rulers of kingdoms in that time, when, when they, they were in a season of peace. When the kingdom was at peace, when, they, when there was no war going on, the king would ride through the community in a donkey. That was how he got around. That was the season of peace. But when it was time for battle, when it was time to wage war on another kingdom, the king would ride around on a stallion. So it's important to see how Jesus comes in. One, Jesus is coming into the city humbly. He's e entering into the city in a humble manner. And two, he's coming into the city with shouts of praise. As we read in verse 8, as it continues, it says, The crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches, just like the one you have in your hand, and they laid it on the ground in front of him. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest of heaven. What they're shouting here is, Hosanna. Hosanna, they're praising him as he's entering. And I don't know if you've ever had an experience in your life where you've entered something and people just sang your praises. Anybody ever had that? I have. As a college football player, every Saturday, I would come out the tunnel and everyone was cheering for us. Yes! Woo! Go team! And it was just everybody thought we were the greatest in the world until I made a holding penalty. Or until, until we fumbled the ball. And then all of these cheers become anger and yelling. And these people that were like, Shane, you're the best. Now it's like, Shane, you're so dumb. How does that happen? As I was reading this, as we go on to read, and we know the Easter story, these shouts of praise, these hosannas that they're singing, we know that in a week, just in a week's time, these people are going to go from shouting praise to shouting crucify him. In just one week. And so as we learn from the life of Jesus, we need to learn something for us today. That we should not be fueled by the praises of man. We should not be fueled by people singing our praises. By telling us how good of a job we're doing. 
by, by telling us how well we're doing. That's not what should fuel us. We should be fueled by the presence of one. And I think about it, like sometimes, I'll be honest, I preach a sermon up here, and I leave, and I'm like, that was not good. And I'll walk out in the lobby, and you guys are all like, that was the best. And I'm like, nah, you don't really mean that. You know, because here's the truth. What I'm, why I'm saying that is I'm joking a little bit, but why I'm saying that is, is the reason why I do this, the reason why I feel comfortable preaching a message is, is I prepare during the week getting together with my Savior, and when I stand up here, I'm here to impress. I'm here to, to worship one person, one God. It's not about pleasing you. It's about pleasing him. And just like Jesus starts with these praises, eventually they're going to turn to anger and turn to resentment. We can't be fueled by the praise of man, amen? So they're shouting this word, Hosanna. Hosanna, as they're dropping these palm branches down, they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which literally translate, that translated means save us now. Save us now. As they're, they're singing these praises to Jesus, they're saying, save us Save us. And I want to just paint this picture for you on this triumphal entry. As Jesus is entering the city, think about this. There's thousands of people gathered to celebrate this Passover. And all of a sudden, there's this, this commotion at the gate to the city. And people start to get ramped up and energized, and they start to make their way to the gate. And now thousands of people are just shouting to this Messiah, this king, save us now. Save us now. Can you imagine the energy that's in the city, what people are thinking? Think about what the Roman Empire's thinking at this time. Who is this? Who is this man? Why are they saying, save us? Why are they shouting to save us now? And the palm branches that they're laying down in the traditional sense was the laying down of a victory march. They're, they're laying down these palm branches proclaiming the victory of Jesus is upon us. This conqueror is coming to the city. Now here's what the crowd thinks in this moment. What the crowd thinks is happening in this moment. Most of the ones shouting these praises, what they think is happening is Jesus is coming to depose the Roman government. To overthrow it. He's coming to overthrow this worldly government that has felt like it was oppressing and holding down the Jewish people. So they're, they're wanting this immediate overthrow of power. Now, what ends up happening in this scenario? That doesn't happen. What they get instead of a powerful overthrow is a surrender. They get the king surrendering. They get him laying down his own life. Because here's the truth. Jesus wasn't there for that government overthrow to rule that kingdom. Jesus is there on an eternal mission to become the ruler of the kingdom of heaven. That's why he's there. He's got the bigger plan in action. He knows what's on the line. But what happens is, is the people throughout this week, as we dive into this, we're going to start to realize these people who are shouting the praises of Jesus start to turn on him because their expectations of him are not being met. They have expectations of what this conquering king who comes to the city should be doing, but these expectations aren't met throughout the week. And we have to ask ourselves this, as we look at this story we have to apply it to our life today. How does this apply to us? We have to ask ourselves the question, does Jesus meet my expectations? Does Jesus meet my expectations for my life? And the easiest way for us to look at that is to look at how we talk with him, how we pray with him, how we spend time in community with him. You know, it, we, we often say like when we're praying for healing, God, I'm praying for healing. God, I need you to move. But how often do we pray prayers like this? God, heal me like this. God, heal me in this way. God, Jesus, heal me how I want to be healed. Or maybe something like this. God, speak to me. But internally, it's God, speak to me like this. Speak to me how I want to hear. Speak, answer my will, God. Confirm the thoughts that are in my heart. Not what your will is. Or this one, how many times do we pray this prayer? Jesus, move, move. Jesus, move like, but Jesus, move like this. I want you to, to move in this person or that person like this. And when it doesn't happen, our expectations are, are rubbed against each other because we had an expectation of how Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Kings should be moving. 
Or what about this one? I don't want to offend people, but I'm going to. Um, God, see the world like me. Think about this. As we, we, these expectations, Jesus, see the world like how I see it. Jesus, I mean, uh, you know, give me clarity, but give me clarity on how I want to see it and how I view your people, how I view your church. Or how about this one? Jesus, how I view politics. How, how I view the politics of the people running my country. Give me what my will is for them instead of us going to him in a place of reverence and respect and saying, Jesus, give me your will. If how I'm thinking is wrong, if my expectations are wrong, change them. Change them. We have to ask ourselves this question. Do we really want Jesus to move in our life? Do we really want Jesus to move in our life? Or do we just want him to help us get to where we want to go? How often do we use Jesus like this? We have a will for our life. We have a plan for our life. And we're like, Jesus, please come along for the ride. Uplift me. Help me. Get to where I need to go. When the truth is, the truth is, is that we should be responding with him in a place that comes from, Jesus, you are leading. You are in charge. Take me where you want me to go. Uh, one of my mentors once said to me, as I was contemplating this thought, is, is Jesus enough for me? Is what Jesus wants for my life enough for me? Am I willing to step out of my own will and, and, and everything? He asked me this question that kind of rocked me to my core. He said this, Shane, if one day you made it to heaven, but Jesus wasn't there, would you be okay with that? Would you, I mean, you, you got the result you wanted. You have eternity in heaven, but Jesus isn't there. Would you be okay with that? And it made me question my time here I have on earth. Then I need to fall more in love with this King Jesus. I need to allow him to lead my life. So here we go. Jesus is about to enter the city. He's right at the gates. And two th significant things happen. One, the first thing that happens is Jesus cries at the gate. He cries at the gate. In Luke 19, verse 41, it says this. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. Last week we referred to Jesus weeping over Lazarus, and here we see him weeping again. He, and then he, later on in the scripture, it goes on, he starts to talk about the destruction that's to come to the city and the destruction of the people as he sees this destruction that's coming, and it causes him to weep. So what makes Jesus sad? What gets Jesus to a place of weeping? I have four things here for you, and these apply to us in our life. One, when we are religious but wrong. When we are religious but we're wrong. When we, we're really good at traditions, we're really good at the religious sayings and the words, but we are missing the whole point of what we're doing. When we can do all the right things on Sunday, and we can come to church and in the lobby, we're out there shaking hands and smiling. Everything's great, woo! But then Monday, I mean, Monday through Saturday look completely different. We're playing a role. It brings Jesus to tears. It makes him weep because we're missing out on the whole point of this. This isn't a day of the week. Following Jesus is not a Sunday thing. It's a lifetime thing. It's every day. We can play religion all we want. But religion and traditions did not die on a cross for us to go to heaven. Jesus did. We can't just play this. The second thing is this, is when we miss his heart. What makes Jesus weep is when we miss his heart, especially for his people. When we miss his heart for the people who are around us, when we don't follow what he tells us to do and to love him and to love people, when we miss that, when we treat people with anger and resentment and rage, it, it makes him sad. The third thing, when we destroy ourselves. When we destroy ourselves, when we, we, we do things to ourselves that destroy us, that hurt us. Maybe it's the, the sin in our life that we keep letting back in. Maybe, maybe it's the lies from the enemy we keep believing. But it, it hurts him when, when he knows what's best for us. And he knows if we make the right decisions, our life would look one way, but we choose to go another way. The fourth thing is this. When we harden our ears to his cry. When Jesus is crying out to us, when he's speaking to us, when he's looking to make a change in our life and our ears are hardened and our heart is hardened towards him. You know, because let's be honest, there's things that can harden our ears towards the voice of God. Maybe it's the hurt from our past. 
Maybe it's the current sin we're living in, but this will cause our ears to harden. So as he's talking to us, it's not hitting. It's, it's not becoming life-changing. It's not impacting us. I don't know if you notice this, but when I pray, almost every sermon I pray, when I come out here, in my prayer, I say, Jesus, take away my, open up my ears and open up my heart to hear you. I don't want anything, any lies I'm believing, any, any sin I'm living in to stop me from hearing you today. We need, to, we need to acknowledge that there's stuff in our life that is stopping us from seeing and hearing Jesus clearly. The second thing Jesus does after he enters the city, now he's in the city. So when we think about this, we just had this big celebration. Jesus entered the city. Now what is he going to do first? The first thing he's going to do is he's going to the temple. He's going to the place of worship. And it says this in verse 12. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animal sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called the house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Think what's going through the, the, the people's mind right now. They were just singing praises. Come overthrow the government. And Jesus shows up at the place of worship and is flipping their tables. Wait, what? That's not why you're here. You're not here to condemn us, God. You're here to overthrow this government. You're flipping the tables. He's mad. I love this visual of Jesus because it helps me relate to him a little bit. You know, like he just got so mad he had to flip a table. Anybody ever been there? But he's there and it, it, we have to ask ourselves, what makes Jesus get to this point with these people? What makes him mad? And in this instance, what makes him mad is when people use religion to manipulate and take advantage of people. Because what we don't see in this story is that everyone who's coming to the city to celebrate Passover has to go to the temple and receive two things. They have to receive an animal sacrifice and temple coins. And they have to have that to properly practice in this Passover celebration. But what the money changers and the merchants are doing is they know that it's a time where a lot of people are coming to the city for this. So they're hiking the rates up. They're, they're, they're raising the price of doves. They're hiking the rates up. You know, it'd be kind of like in our world, let's put it this way. It's, you know, if we want to go buy a hotel here for a night, it's not that much right now. But if you try to book a hotel on hot August night weekend, what's that rate doing? It's skyrocketing. It's inflation. It's like the gas prices. Sore subject, I know. Uh, and so what is happening here is Jesus is going in and he's saying, it is not right that you're taking advantage of these people who are trying to worship. You're, you're making a gain off of them. He's not saying that it's not right that they're selling them. He's not, he's not saying that. What he's saying is they're manipulating the process for their own personal gain. And what Jesus does, he goes into the temple and he begins to flip these tables. And what he's really doing is he's flipping the expectations of the people. He's saying, this is not what it's about. You're missing the mark. This area in your life that you thought you were doing the right thing, you thought you were doing everything right, you're missing the mark. The expectations for this are different. This isn't right. So I have to ask myself, as I think about this, as I put myself in this situation, I ask, is there any areas in my life that need flipped? Is there any areas where my expectations for them don't align with God's expectations for them? Is there any areas in my life that I've become hardened and, and callous to that I need Jesus to come and flip the tables of expectations over? Maybe it's my family. Maybe it's your family. What your expectation for your family is, is it aligned with what Jesus' expectation is? Are you surviving or thriving? Maybe it's your church here. Maybe it's this church and what your expectations are for the church and your involvement with the church is. I remember one time when I was at church service when I was a brand new Christian, I was sitting in the back row and the pastor was talking about this connection to the body of Christ and Jesus flipped over my expectation of what church was. It wasn't something I just went and observed. 
It was something that I was being called into to dedicate the rest of my life to. And whatever that looked like. Maybe it's our, the expectations of how we treat people. That we need Jesus to come to a radical flipping of the tables in our life on how we're treating the people around us. How we're showing the grace of Jesus. This is what Jesus does right after he enters the city. Right after he enters the city. Why is that important? This is was his first stop was to go flip these tables and reset the expectations of what it should be. And that these people, how and the people that were just crying Hosanna, you could start to see how if you know the Easter story, how these cries of Hosanna are starting to get a little different. And by the end of the week, these cries of Hosanna are turned into cries of crucify him. Crucify him. All because of what Jesus does and what Jesus did in this time was Jesus found the status quo. Jesus found where people were comfortable. Jesus found that and he pushed into it. He pushed into it. He he found where where they needed change, where they were resistant to change. He said, I'm willing to cross the line. I'm pushing into it, even if it makes you uncomfortable. I always tell people this. If you ever find yourself comfortable in your faith, like, it's hey, everything's great right now. Just be ready. That pushing's coming. That pushing's coming. Because what Jesus wants most of all is for us to be 100% sold out to him, in love with him. That's what he wants. So let's ask ourselves, how do the cries of Hosanna change to cries of crucify him in less than a week? How does this happen? How does this happen in our life? Because I, a lot of times I look at this story And I would like to think that I would never have been those people who were yelling, crucify him. That I I would have stayed in that posture of Hosanna. That I would have been celebrating him the whole time. And, you know, I can look at them and say, how could they do that? I would never do that to my Jesus. But the truth is, when I'm honest with myself and we're honest with each other, we do this all the time. We do this all the time. Where we start off in this place where we're spiritually up high, we're lifted up, we're like on this mountaintop experience, and then things start happening in life that bring us back down to a place of frustration and anger and resentment. So what are the things that can harden our heart towards Jesus? I wrote down these four things. First is this. When we forget about the magnitude and the holiness of God, when we forget how big and great God is. When we lose sight of his sovereignty and his perfection, this awesome creator God, and we allow things in our life to work him down to just some magical, mystical creature in the sky. That's not what God is. God is a holy and perfect and beautiful and magnificent. What can harden us is when we start to lose sight of that. We start to lose sight of his power and what he's doing. The second is this. When we don't trust him to come through. When we don't trust him to come through. When we're praying those prayers and in the back of our mind we're questioning, is he really strong enough? Is Jesus really strong enough to set me free from this addiction? Is Jesus really strong enough to heal my family? Is Jesus strong enough? to bring restoration and peace. These thoughts that sneak into our head can start to harden us to the the amazingness of Jesus and his grace. The third is this. Like we've been talking about, when Jesus doesn't meet our expectations, when that prayer might be answered, but it wasn't answered the way you thought it would be. When you were praying for a yes, but you got a no. Anybody ever had that? I know there's been times where I've been praying for yes and I've gotten a no and I've started to have this, how could you, God? I believed. I was fully in. I fully trusted you. But sometimes what we need is a no. Sometimes our understanding of what we want in this yes we're asking for, God says, no, the best thing for you is a no. I know the whole plan. I know where it's going. Trust me. We can't lose sight of that. And the fourth thing is this, when we are not focused on the big plan, when we are not focused on the eternal plan of Jesus, when we lose sight of this 
and we get caught up in the day in, day out frustrations and hurts, the pain of today, the hurt of yesterday, and it causes us to lose sight of the glory of tomorrow. We have to keep this, this big plan, this big, this big idea of what God is doing in perspective and not get caught up in just the day in, day out. I want to be in a spot in my life. Man, you know, it's just full transparency. This hard one to say. I want to get to the spot in my life. Jesus, if you don't answer the prayer, I, I love you anyway. Jesus, if you don't come through, I love you anyway. Jesus, if you don't send me the money I need, I love you anyway. I want to get to that place to where I'm just, it is just about Jesus and who he is, not what he can do for me, not what I'm expecting from him. These laying down of the palm branches, these right here, was a sign of surrender as they proclaiming the victory of Jesus. And when they laid them down at his feet, they were, they were giving them to him, saying, you are the victorious one. I'm giving you this. What's the areas in our life that we need to lay down, that we need to give to Jesus today, that we need him to flip the expectations over, that we need him to move in, but what do we need to lay down? Maybe it's the hardened heart and the hardened ears. Maybe it's the trials of today, but is there something that we need to lay down at his feet? Because what I don't want for us to happen as a church is for us to be at a place of Hosanna, but get to the place of anger, place of resentment. I want us to stay in the place of proclaiming how great Jesus is, proclaiming he's the king, proclaiming he's the Messiah. Because there was a whole plan that started the moment Jesus entered the city. There was a whole plan. And here's how it goes. I'm gonna ruin Easter for you, I hope that's okay. Here's how it goes. Jesus enters the city, and as he enters the city, he's, he he's enters with praise and palm branches being laid down and shouts of celebration. But in that week, as Jesus spends teaching and healing and talking to people, preparing his disciples for what's to come and all of that, rebuking religious leaders, this all happens in this week. And in that week, those shouts of Hosanna turned to, turn to shouts of crucify him. And by Friday, he finds himself going to a cross. Going to a cross. Going from the courtroom to the cross to pay the price that we, he didn't deserve to pay. It's so much so that the person who's overseeing his death says, I, I don't want to make this decision. I want you to make the decision, people. I want you to make the decision. So you can either have Jesus die on the cross or you can have this murderer, Barabbas. You can have him or him. And one of them you get back. It was no longer Hosanna, save us. It was crucify him. Crucify the king of kings. Crucify the Messiah. Give us the murderer, Barabbas. And that's what happened. Jesus goes to the cross and he makes the painful journey, the journey of sorrow and pain to the cross. And he dies there. He dies on that cross as his blood is shed to cover your sins and my sins because he had to be the sacrificial lamb to die for you and for me so we could spend eternity with him. And then he goes to the tomb. He goes to the tomb and everybody thinks it's over. The enemy thinks he's won. The people think it's done. But he pulls a Tom Brady and he says, I'm coming back. And three days later, he rises from the tomb and he ascends to heaven. Opening the pathway for us to spend eternity with him. The gospel doesn't end with the cross and the tomb. The gospel of Jesus is still happening today. And he's using people like you and like me to spread that message. And here's the great thing, is it's not over. Because when he went to heaven, he promised he'd be back. He promised he would be back. And when he comes back, 
He is coming back in a different style. He's not coming back humbly on a donkey. He's coming in, riding in to claim what is rightfully his, to defeat the devil and take back what is his. To take back what is his. The gospel, the gospel didn't end thousands of years ago. The gospel is still alive. It's still life changing. Jesus is still moving. He's still calling people close to him. And one day he will come back and he will set us free forever. And we can spend eternity with him. And so no matter what the devil throws at you, no matter what hardships you're facing, you can hold on to that, that God is a God of his word and he's coming back. Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, let this be our cry, that we stay in a posture of Hosanna, singing save us now as we await your return, God. But with the time we have left, let us love as many people as we can love. Let us show your grace to as many people as we can. And let us stay in a place without hardened hearts or hardened ears that we cry, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Amen.